applaud for our lives. Yes, we did do it for many of those who are struggling with addiction at this time. We ask that what Mr. Eric is going to say will help them. We ask to bring it all those others who are in need of prayers. Please be with them, Father. Please comfort those who need it. Thank you most of all for your son and his death on the cross for our sins. And it's your name we ask this prayer. Amen. 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 <coughs> Mr. Aaron. Sounds bad. I don't know if that means I'm getting old. Oh, yeah, that was not supposed to be the answer. So behind me on the screen, and I didn't do this at the last one. At the last seminar I gave, I didn't do this. Mostly because if I look back there, it's going to be bad. That's Ryan. He doesn't look like a drug addict, does he? In fact, I took that photo during Christmas a number of years ago. That's him. He's the reason why I'm doing this. It is hard losing somebody that you love. It's especially hard when you lose them over something senseless. And tonight what we're going to talk about, this is, this is there, there are two really hard lessons for me to give. The very first one, where I went back and I, I talked about the history and, and kind of how we got to where we were at. And then this one. These are the two har hardest lessons that I give. So I'm going to say it to you just like I did on Sunday morning. Give me some grace. Because I might not make it through it. It was September 11th, 2001. Many of y'all remember that day, right? It was an interesting day for my brother and I. We met, we had an adjoining bathroom between our, our rooms at the house, and I was getting ready to go to work, and Ryan was getting ready to go to school. He was a junior in high school at the time. And we met there in the bathroom and we said goodbye and good luck. What I'm about to tell you is gonna sound really strange. And you won't believe me, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I didn't believe it either, and I, I certainly can't answer why or what, how this all came about. But about a year before, in 2020, or 2020, 2000, 2020 was a couple years ago. In 2000, I told a couple of friends of mine about this occurrence where every single time it was 9-11, whether at night or in the morning, and there was a digital clock there, I would look at it. I kid you not. If it was 9-11 in the morning, I would look at that clock and I would see on it, and then the same thing would happen at night. If it was 9-11 at night, I would look at the clock, and it would say 9-11. Creepy. I never said this to my brother. But in 2000, I happened to be telling a group of friends of mine, and Ryan was there. And I said this out loud, and Ryan got this look on his face like, you've got to be kidding me. Ryan had been having a reoccurring dream. Now, I, I want to put a time out right here real quick. I don't, I don't think this is prophetic. Just, that's not what this is. Okay, I, This is entirely coincidental, the way all of this came together. But when you hear what's about to happen, Ryan and I tried to rationalize it the best that we could as a 17-year-old and a 21-year-old. We had no idea what was going on. 
But Ryan said he had been having a reoccurring dream. If any of y'all ever played the Super Nintendo, you would remember the game called GoldenEye. It was the James Bond game. Well, in that game was a particular map where you had to get to the end of the map and stop the bomb from exploding in order to save the whole world. I mean, it's James Bond after all. And Ryan said that he was having this dream that he was the character in the video game and he was trying his hardest to get to the end, but the countdown timer kept going down and it hit nine minutes and 11 seconds and boom, game over. The world ended. I had been looking at the clock and seeing 9-11 constantly. Ryan had been having this reoccurring dream, so we put our heads together. Something bad was going to happen. We just knew it. And it was 2000. And so we came up with a couple of ideas. Well, maybe on September 11th, Grandpa's going to die. You see, my grandfather had been very sick, had been in the hospital in Pittsburgh, and was not doing very well at all. December 7th, 2000, my grandfather passed. That obviously wasn't it. So we thought more about it and more about it. And Ronnie finally hypothesized right around September 11th, 2001, he came up with the idea that something, we don't know what was going to happen, but something was going to happen on that day, but it was going to change our lives. That's what he thought. So on September 11th, 2001, as we met there in the bathroom, Ryan gave me the biggest hug I think I've ever had. We didn't know what was going to happen. We don't pretend to, to have some kind of special gifts or anything like that. We know those things don't, don't exist any longer. But there was an air of something amiss as we stood there that morning. I got in my car. Ryan got in his car. He drove to school, and I was driving to work. And the entire time I was driving to work, I was anxious, nervous. I wasn't so much concerned about what would happen if it was going to happen to me. I was concerned about what would happen if it happened to Ryan. And then suddenly I get a telephone call. A friend of mine says, you have to turn on the news. You have to see what's going on. And so I quickly flipped to the radio station and I heard what was happening over the radio. And I'll be honest with you, I know this sounds bad, but I was relieved. And what was happening was terrible. The lives that were lost is terrible. But I got to see my brother again. We tried that again with lottery numbers, but it didn't work. <laughs> now I'm just kidding. We didn't play the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> That's creepy, right? It's really odd. And I wish that life always worked that way, that you had a heads up that something was coming. But life does not give us that luxury, does it? We don't get to know what is coming next. We don't get to see ahead. I would be afraid if we did. I can't imagine what kind of weight and pressure would be on me if I knew when and how I was going to die. What a terrible burden. We aren't promised anything. Jesus tells us that the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night, right? We don't know when. We don't know when he's coming back. And we don't know when he's going to call us home. 
So with that in mind, what we have to understand is, is that we have to take and live every moment, every minute, every hour with intention of never being able to get it back. We are never going to be able to be who we were 10 minutes ago. We may still act the same, use the same language, we may still be just the same, but we are not the same because we are 10 minutes older. Those 10 minutes are gone. They are gone forever and we will never get them back. The words that we have said or not said, we do not get a chance to say them again at that moment. Which is why life is so very important for us to intentionally, not accidentally, not haphazardly, not just bouncing around with whatever whims life throws at us. We need to intentionally live, intentionally act. The things that we say, the places that we go, the people that we hang out with, the things that we do. intention behind them or else we may never get that chance again but because we know that with every passing minute we are coming closer to an end and that end is inevitable it is inevitable it is appointed unto man once to die and then after that is the judgment. We are heading somewhere. It is inevitable. And so tonight's lesson is called the inevitable end. Whether we want it to or not, it's coming. It is coming. And it may not happen when we think or want it to happen. I told you yesterday about the guy at work who was struggling with meth. This stuff is terrible. It hollows you out. It destroys you from the inside. It takes, o takes you over and turns you into a slave. But yet this guy was intentionally doing it. And so as we had been standing there and talking, I pulled him aside from everybody else. And I said to him, I said, you don't know when your end will be. If you continue down this path, it is inevitable that one day you are going to die from it. And he shook his head. He agreed. I said, you won't be left with the pain uh, and sorrow of your choices. But your two little girls, who are probably going to be the ones that find you, will be. intentionality we need to think through our actions you know as we think about the idea of an inevitable end you know we need to understand a few things the people in the towers on 9-11 they didn't choose to die people in car wrecks they didn't choose to die kids that with cancer. They did not choose cancer and die. They did not choose that. But those who willfully ignore and grow their dependence on substance, they are choosing that death. See, they put themselves first. Not their children. Not their families. Not the impact their decisions are making on the lives of others. And I know that firsthand. I'm not downplaying by any means how hard it is to break addiction. Dealing with people who have addiction, working with a friend of mine, Blake, who runs a program there in Tallapoosa. I've been to the meetings, I've met the people. I, I, I get to talk to Blake about it regularly, and I ask him, I say, hey, how is so-and-so doing? Well, they're not doing very well. 
They were clean for so many years. And now they're not doing well. See, I'm not saying that it is going to be easy just by realizing what we're doing. It's not going to be just that easy to say, oh, I'm doing meth and I'm messing my life up. I should probably stop. No, that's not how it works. But deep introspection, like we talked about yesterday, confronting yourself, changing your habits, looking at your cues, what is driving you to do the things that you do? And let's just take it a step further because I know a lot of y'all in here, y'all are addicts. What habits do you have in your life that are causing you to miss out on things? What actions do you do daily that take you away from your family? What words do you use? What tone do you have? What way do you interact with your kids, your spouse, your friends, your coworkers? What are you doing? What is your habit that is separating you from other people? In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus told us to go into all the world. Folks, y'all are already in it. You go to all the world every day. You go to all the world when you go to work. You go to all the world when you go to the grocery store. You go to all the world whenever you go home and see your kids. Are you being the light that Jesus told you to be while you're going to all the world? If not, why not? What habits do you have that are separating you from being able to fulfill the ultimate command to go. Again, I'm not downplaying how hard it is to quit an addiction, but I am saying that the lack of realizing the inevitable end, even in our habits, keeps us from taking the first <laughs> steps. There is an inevitable end for all of us. This can mean a lot of different things in different contexts. You remember yesterday we talked about fingernail biting. How many of y'all bit your fingernails? Since then, be honest. I thought I was going to get in trouble. Yesterday, as we were sitting there, sitting here, I caught a hangnail. <laughs> First thing I did was, Roop! and as I had my nail in my mouth, I thought, everyone's going to see me. <laughs> For those that bite your fingernails, you're going to have a lower quality of life. It's an inevitable end. You're going to have to shake people's hands like this, so that way they can't see your nails. And you'll have to talk to them like this. What about those of you that drink? There's an inevitable end. You're killing yourself. Is this thing not working? I think I've, I've messed this thing up. I keep, whoa, what was that? OK. <laughs> We'll just, we'll just keep going. <laughs> you know, there's an inevitable end for drinking. You're killing your liver. You're slowing your metabolism. You're creating a dependency on alcohol, a substance, in order to help you feel like you can get through stressful situations. There's an inevitable end. To those that are made of it. You will lose friends. You will lose influence. And ultimately, you cannot fulfill the mission of Christ if you are mean to others. You know, there is an inevitable end to everything. What's so funny, though, is that people on the outside is your inevitable end. You aren't fooling anyone. If you are mean and you hand somebody flowers, they're going to be suspicious of you. You're not fooling anyone. Don't. I 
I'll refrain from saying that. Days leading up to Melissa's surgery, we were nervous. She was having a hysterectomy. And this can be a dangerous procedure. And so she was nervous and anxious, and I was nervous and anxious, and I was trying to remain calm and, and to keep her calm. But I don't think it would work. I don't think I was doing a very good job. When you see someone that you love who is worried, it makes you worry too, doesn't it? You know, there would be a lot of pain associated with this surgery. A lot of pain. In fact, in the, the pre-op, the doctor even mentioned that we are going to be giving you a lot of pain medication to manage the pain. So I told my parents about the surgery that was upcoming. And my brother, who was living with my parents at the time, also had heard about the surgery that was upcoming. And my brother was definitely in the middle of some of his deepest addiction at that moment. And so my brother's response was, he wrote Melissa, and he said, I'm thinking about coming up for your surgery to be there to help out if you need anything. You know, instantly my mind turned. It turned to Ryan just wants the drugs. Yeah, I mean, he says he loves us. He says he cares about us. He wants to be there for us. But that's not why Ryan is coming. Ryan is coming because he knows that we are going to have oxycodone, codeine, or tramadol, or any of these other very potent and powerful drugs that can take and really mess you up. And so I made up some excuse for Ryan not to be there. The night before surgery, Ryan texted Melissa, and she ignored it. You see, because of what people see in us, because of our actions, because of the decisions that we make, the things that we do on a regular basis, they can prejudge us, our intentions, whether right or or wrong, they get a good, solid guess at what you actually want. So the surgery started the next day at about lunch and went on for a few hours and Melissa was I was worried about her, and so I didn't leave her side. About 8.30 at night, I was finally getting hungry. Melissa had finally passed out after the doctors had given her or the nurses had given her some medicine to help her with the pain. And so at 8.30 at night, from the hospital right over there, I drove to Taco Bell to get nachos. I tried to get that large nacho thing. Y'all remember that? No, no, this was bigger. It was like, it was the nacho super extra grande. I don't know what they called it. The girl literally told me, I was like, I want to order this. And she was like, are you just eating it? And I said, yes. And she said, that's made for like five people. Pick something else. <laughs> OK, so I got the smaller nachos. <laughs> I remember it clearly because that was also the night of the presidential debate. And so I'm sitting in my car after I had driven back to the hospital, knowing that Melissa was still asleep, 
I'm sitting in my car, eating my nachos, and listening to the presidential debate, and Ryan calls. It was 9.13 at night. I was irritated. Beyond belief, irritated. I mean, how persistent can someone possibly be? All he wanted was drugs. I knew it. Why was he continuing to bother me about this? So I didn't answer the phone. I declined the call, and it went to voicemail. I didn't listen to it. I picked up my stuff, and I went inside. And the night went kind of as you would expect following a major surgery like that, nurses in and out of the room all night long, Melissa waking up in pain every couple of hours, the, the little bed couch thing that they have in there is made of concrete, so you don't sleep. So when I woke up in the morning, they served Melissa breakfast, and then a little while later they brought her lunch, and she wasn't hungry, but it looked disgusting. So she offered it to me. <laughs> and it's about 11 o'clock or so, and I politely declined to eat that and was putting on my stuff, getting ready to go out to go get uh, some real lunch, you know, something like Chick-fil-A. Amen. Amen. That's right. And so as I'm sitting there talking with Melissa about food, my phone rings. And it's odd. See, it is a friend of mine from down in Valdosta. He is a, uh, the, the son of one of the elders down there. We, I've known him for a very long time. He used to be a sheriff down there for Lowndes County, uh, or a sheriff deputy for Lowndes County. And I get a call from him, and I'm thinking, you know what, this must be a wrong call. I get a lot of wrong number calls because my name starts with A. Generally, I'm the one that gets out of your phone. Y'all have done it to me too, I'm sure. <laughs> and so I ignore the telephone call, and directly after the call ends, he calls back again. And I'm thinking, well, he must be sitting on his telephone now. This must be what it is. He has no reason to call me whatsoever. I've never talked to him on the telephone, ever. And then a voicemail pops up. Aaron, I need you to call me. So I told Melissa, and she said, well, that's odd. And so I called him back, and he didn't answer the phone. Hey, buddy, how you doing? You know, long time no see. No, he answered back, and he said this. He said, Aaron, I don't know how to tell you this. But Ryan is dead. Your dad found him a few minutes ago. And I rushed here when I heard it on the police radio. I couldn't believe what he was saying. Both Melissa and I broke down in tears, and I just sat there. You know, I eventually I would find out that they estimated his death was between midnight and one. So what that means is only a matter of hours after he had called me, he died. You know, was he calling because he needed help? Only because he knew something was wrong? Was he calling because he wanted to say goodbye? Or was he calling because he missed me? So after I left the hospital, I was heading back home 
to the house to get ready to leave to go down to Valdosta, and I played his voicemail. I've only been able to listen to it one other time. I can't bring myself to do it. I have been in some tough, tough situations in my life. Between the war in Iraq and, and things like that, I have been through some very serious things. But I can't listen to his voicemail. Because he had just called being the same silly Ryan that he always was. Just to put a smile on my face. Being goofy, telling me that he missed me. See, it had nothing to do with the drugs. It had nothing to do with him wanting pills. He wasn't going to come up here because he wanted something from us. He was going to come up here because he wanted to give something to us. See, we make the mistake of thinking that nobody else notices what we're going through. And we make the mistake of thinking that people will not judge us based on our actions and our words and, what we, and, and how we treat other people. But we do. Even as wrong as we may get it sometimes, we do. And we need to realize that our actions will cause an inevitable end, not only for ourselves, but for the way that people view us. I miss this so much. You know, maybe all this could have been avoided if I had just answered the phone. So always answer the phone. Amen. People that matter to us, those we love unconditionally, are worth our attention despite the circumstances. When someone is in an addiction, there are only a hand they become acutely aware of the mess that they are in. At that time, we must stand ready, willing, and able to answer that call, drop everything we are doing to be there. This might be the only opportunity we have to rescue them. So my question to you this evening right now is, is there a Ryan in your life? Someone that you love unconditionally, but someone that is going through something in their life that is holding them back and keeping them down, and you don't know how to deal with them. You don't know how to respond to them. You don't know what their next move will be. You don't even know how they're going to treat you from one day to the next because they are not themselves. They are under the spell of something worse. Is there someone like that in your life tonight? If there is, if there is, you need to be prepared. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that, that he may have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Use the time you have right now. Because it won't always be there. You know, this is hard. We stop seeing the person that we love as a person. I didn't answer the phone because I didn't see Ryan. I 
And I'm sure at one point or another in my life, people didn't see me, they saw my addiction. When all I wanted them to do was see me. To help me get out of my addiction. But we aren't just our addiction. We are still the people that you love. The end only stays inevitable as long as they stay in that state. Be there for them to help them to move when they are ready. The inevitable end for users is death. The inevitable end for those that love them is pain. The pain of watching someone spiral down out of control and not caring if you are hurt by it. For those that are users and you are listening, you are not fooling anyone. You are not so smart that you can predict when to jump off that habit. You aren't so strong that you can decide you'll just wait and do it one day because that one day never comes. You must take action now. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. Psalms 39 and verse 4, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. We are not invincible, folks. Thinking you are invincible is foolish. Not caring is even worse. You need to realize how short life is and how much you are loved. You need to make sure that you let those you love who are struggling know how loved they really are. I get it, though. I get it. See, when you are a, when you are a user, when you are someone struggling with any kind of addiction, whether it is alcoholism, whether it is pornography, whether it is some kind of substance abuse, whatever your addiction is, there is a point that you reach in your mind where you think, honestly, nobody cares and nobody loves you. You will hit that point. You feel like you are worthless. You are unloved. You are unworthy. But that is not true. Those feelings are not true. You know, that is a lie that is being told to you by Satan. You need to stop avoiding the people and places where you know you can get help. Believe it or not, I care. I may not know you, but I know your worth. I know what you mean to God, and I know that with a changed heart, you can show others you care about them as well. You know, we get wrapped up in thinking that life is all about us, don't we? It's an easy trap to get stuck in, but truly we don't live until you, until you start doing things for others. We make the mistake of the benefit of caring for others is not being something we benefit from. But even Jesus understood that giving was very important. You know, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. Serving connects us to the heart of Christ. Allows us to see things in yourself that you've strengths and weaknesses. You know, there is a reason why Jesus even gave the greatest command the way that he did, isn't there? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. 
Folks, if we are going to help those who are in need, we need to understand that simple truth. We need to love others enough to hurt for them. That doesn't mean hurt with them. Jesus, the master teacher, came to this earth, and he was seen with the sinners. But he wasn't seen sinning with the sinners. We need to make sure that we are putting ourselves in a position to be able to help people, to be there for them, but not enabling them, not giving them permission to do the things that they are doing, but to be there to hold their hand when they are ready to walk away from it. Here's a fact. We naturally delay helping and getting help. Ladies, Ask your man when the last time he stopped mid-trip to get directions. <laughs> we delay. We don't act quickly. And in a situation like, like addiction, when we see someone else struggling, there is a natural tendency for what we call the bystander effect. Have you heard that? The bystander effect. See, the bystander effect basically says that someone else will take care of it. And in a group of people, everyone is thinking someone else will take care of it. They want to help. They realize there is a need to help, but someone else will take care of it. And if I go to help take care of it, I'll just get in the way. That is wrong. The reason why the bystander effect is called the way that it is is because whatever, what happens in that situation is everyone ends up standing by. And no one does anything. Be the person that takes action. See, it's natural for people to freeze or go into shock when seeing someone have an emergency or being attacked. This is usually a response to fear. The fear that you are too weak to help, that you might be misunderstanding the context and seeing a threat where there is none, or even that intervening will put your own life in danger. In most cases, that is not the fact. That is not. Don't be the bystander when action is needed. Also, be the action in your own lives. If we are being attacked, we, we fight, right? If someone were to attack you physically right now, would you fight back? Yes. It's almost instinctively you would fight back. See, we fight physically because we recognize the harm and danger that we are in. We fight because we value our lives or the lives of those around us. And when we fight, and we fight because we ultimately no, there is more that we can accomplish, and we hold dear the idea that no one else should have the power to take our lives. Substance abuse is your attacker. Meth, heroin, alcohol, pills, and even negative thoughts are our attackers. Fight just like you would someone Life is short. Papa, has life been short? Very, very short. And he's seen a lot of days. Remember Psalm 39 and verse 4. Let me know how fleeting I am. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we go, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist, a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. See, the problem is, though, is that we don't need one 
wise words in order to understand this basic concept. Our lives are too short to be wasting, to not be helping. You can march aimlessly towards an inevitable end of early death, or you can change starting today. Just as there is an inevitable end for those who are trapped in addiction, there is also a different inevitable end. The one where you wake up. The one where you decide that your habits and addictions will not push you around any longer. You make changes. Real changes. If you are struggling, finding someone who cares... Remember this. God loves you. Amen. He sent his son to die for you. The song Jesus loves you isn't just a kid's song. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knee before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is blessed or named rather. <clears throat> Excuse me, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses Knowledge Amen. that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God loves you. Amen. You are not alone. The people here love you. That's why they're here. I love you. I may not know you, but I love you. You have a reason to fight, a reason to quit, and a reason to change. You don't have to continue to that inevitable end. <coughs> maybe tonight, maybe tonight you're one of those people struggling. You have been dealing with this on your own for so long that you feel like you can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. My brother used to say that it felt like he was drowning. I can't imagine how terrible it would be to just stand by and watch someone drown. But that's what we're doing when we ignore the cause, when we don't stand ready to help. For those that are in the audience who do not have this trouble, have never had to deal with this, this idea of substance abuse, who miraculously have no bad habits, they don't bite their fingernails, It's your job. It's your job. You have brothers and sisters in the brotherhood throughout the world who are struggling immensely. This is not a problem solely reserved for outside the walls of the church building. We are losing people every day even in the church. It is your job to be your brother's keeper. If you are struggling this evening, if you are hurting this evening, if you feel like you're alone this evening, you have so many people who are ready to help you in any way that they can. I'm not going to, we're not going to do uh, uh, an invitation. 
because the invitation doesn't end with the song. If you find yourself needing help, if you find yourself feeling alone, and you just want someone to help reach out a hand to pull you up out of that water that you are drowning in, we're here for you. I'm here for you. Thank y'all so much for being here this evening. I know how difficult it is to work a full day and then come and listen to some guy yell at you for an hour. But what y'all are doing says volumes about how much you care. And I thank y'all. Tomorrow night, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be looking at what we can do. What we can do that are not struggling. How can we help? How can we help? I hope that you're able to make it tomorrow. If you know somebody that is hurting, struggling, bring them. Let them know that you actually care about them and that you want to see them get better. I think we're going to go ahead and have one song then, and then we're going to have our closing prayer. And um, I, I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Thank you.